Welcome to another episode of That Some Crazy Shit with Kelly and James. As you know by now, season seven, episode three, I am Kelly. And my co-host is Mr. James. Hey, listeners. What's up with everybody? I'm yeah. good. See, I, I keep saying season seven and... You know, let's let's not let's not try to mislead anybody. It's not like we've been doing this podcast for seven years because no. we haven't. A season Almost for two, us, a season for us is thirteen episodes, so and then we take a break. Up. So we're like old school TV. If you ever like watch the Love Boat, it was a season episodes. was thirteen episodes, That's and then they would take a break. Then they would come back and do 13, maybe bonus 14, but a season was normally about 13 episodes. That's what we do because we're old school. So this is season seven for us. This is episode three. We have a really cool guest. We have um, Ed Roman, who is an award-winning singer, songwriter, performer, multi-instrumentalist, from Shelbourne, Ontario, Canada. He's a cool dude. He's got some stuff to talk about. I mean, and you know, people will be like, well, what's crazy shit about him being a musician? Well, that's not really what we talk about with with uh, Ed. He's got some stories to tell, man. Yeah, he's got some he, he, interesting yeah, he stuff to talk about. He's just interesting. I think he's, I think, you know, when he talks about his life and growing up and his family, it's crazy shit. It is. So I'm, I, you know, I really like talking to him, you know, he, and his music as well. He's won awards. He, in 2017, he won the Radio Music Award for Best Americana Artist. And in 2020, he was nominated for the IMEA Award. So... Let me clarify. We have a multi-award winning musician on our show. Yes. Did you ever think did you ever think that we'd be doing that, Kevin? No. And he has crafted songs that have received regular rotations on more than a hundred radio stations across North America and six hundred stations worldwide. I think that's pretty cool. Pretty impressive. Cool. Yeah. Pretty impressive. So let's let's just get right to it. Ready? Let's do it. Welcome to the podcast. Musician and all around cool guy, Ed Roman. So Ed, uh, we talked earlier about uh, some of the crazy shit that you got going on in your life as I sat and listened to it with my jaw just dropped. Why don't you tell our listeners some of the crazy stuff that you got going on? Well, I mean, you know, crazy is what crazy does, you know, as, <laughs> as, as they say in Forrest Gump. Um, I don't know. I, I, we all are uh, dropped on this earth, you know, and we don't always have a choice as to where we land up. Some of us end up in the bowels of a terrible issue and a problem, perhaps in a war-torn, impoverished country. And I found myself in the midst of a family that, you know, came from um, Eastern European background, left Europe when things were getting really crazy, made uh, a life for themselves, and in some cases, some may say a fortune with with my uncle being, you know, a, a robust uranium miner and having federal contracts with the government. And, and then my dad's political career, and I don't like using the word politics because he said, he always would say he's a public servant. He was the first co coalition candidate ever in the history of Canadian federal politics. But prior to that, he, um, he was the mayor of our township for over 30 years, police commissioner for 14. He was also chairman of our region for six years, but as a coalition candidate, each party ousted their leaders and asked my dad to run as an independent for our region, and he won. And he did that while he was fighting multiple sclerosis and eventually succumbed to a brain tumor. But 
My uncle and my father were very close. The cattle export and import business that my mom and dad developed, and, and as well as my uncle being a cattleman and an old style cattleman, not like he, one may consider him to be a, vi a, a visual geneticist. He had the ability to look at two different animals and know we should breed this bull with this heifer because we're going to have an outcome of an animal that is going to have a bloodline that is very rich and formidable. Right. And in 1976, he even sold a calf to Japan for $1.5 million. It was on the cover of Time magazine. It's called Super Cow, right? But this old world uh, concept of thinking and, and what I would call peripheral conscience, as well as a forward thinking conscience in terms of perception and your living moment, it was very self-evident in my uncle and my father. And as a young man, I, I was privileged. I say privileged because I, I, I saw things and understood things at a very young age, long before many people kind of maybe understood what was going on with politics or governmental stuff or maybe world economics. And, you know, my uncle and my dad were very luckily verbal and, and, and also bringing you into the fold with questions like, well, what do you think about this? Do you think this is a good idea? Like, even from a young person's perspective, you know, a good leader will take everybody's suggestion, no matter how old or how young they are, because there could be some consequence to that decision, right? Yeah. And, and, and that's why I said I started my little thing here with, we're all dropped off here on this beautiful ball, and sometimes we are, are blessed because we are, we are fortunate to live in a certain environment and be exposed to certain things and, and other times you struggle. What, my family struggled. We struggled to get out of Europe. Half of my family died, you know, after fascism kicked in and the 30s kicked in. I mean, my grandmother and her sisters used to tell stories about tanks rolling into their village and driving over people and raping women. And, you know, I, 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 I full know well, of, you know, what tyranny looks like because it was omnipresent, even in my family, discussing what happened. You know, my grandfather even said to somebody the other day, he refused to go back to Slovakia because it wasn't, it was gone. It was destroyed. Everything that he remembered, his home, his, his village, the farm fields that he worked in, you know, all of those ideas were, were completely obliterated. So. I guess I, <laughs> my background is cryptic in some way, but I'm very forward thinking about it all. Um, I'm a musician by trade. I, I gravitated to the arts because I'm a dyslexic. Uh, dyslexia, in my mind, is not a, a, a crutch. It's a gift. It's a 3D and perceptual comprehensive learning ability. Uh, I work closely with the Dyslexic Society here in Canada. My One of my videos and songs, Red Omen, from one of my albums has raised an incredible amount of awareness and attention and monies for the Dyslexic Society that does fundraising for kids, for tutoring and facilitating programs. My music is very socio-political, but it's sarcastic and humorous in some ways. I'm always begging and asking for questions and, and for myself as a writer, you know, um, I was taught as a young age that we, Herbie Hancock once said, the definition of an artist is one who has the ability to fuse their life with the rhythm of the times. And when I heard that statement as a young musician, it changed me. I, I felt like I had a duty, you know, as a writer or in some way, a Walt Whitman-esque, Samuel L. Clements kind of way to say, you know, <laughs> I'm tongue in cheek, you know, uh, a lot of my music people say, well, that's really diametrically opposed in terms of your lyrical content, what the chorus is actually saying. That's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to make you think about something, right? Not be literal and, and upfront. So I know I'm a bit of an oddball and I guess that's how I ended up on the show. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, 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 Perfect. And, you know, so uh, it's a pleasure, you know, to be here. That's kind of who I am, you know. And, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead no, go ahead, James. Go ahead. I said, um, now, when we talked about your family before, you had mentioned uh, how they were new about the Illuminati. Well, see, this is the thing. <laughs> Anesta Webster once wrote 
um, people with money will be welcomed into the sect, but kept oblivious to the overall purpose of the sect. The objective of the sect is to enlist brilliant minds to play people against divergent means against one another and to enlist adepts as well as morons in order to further the agenda of what all that represents. So as a young man, I think it was about seven, uh, my uncle would hold uh, church every Sunday in his house. He had a little office, but we it was room for about 12 or 15 of us in our family. And sometimes there'd be so many people that'd be out in the hall. And because my uncle's affiliation with the Vatican at a very young age, my uncle was, you would also consider a theologian. So some of his early friends as a young man were Pope John Paul II, long before he became the Pope when he was a priest and fighting for religious freedoms because of what was going on in the Iron Curtain. As I mentioned before, my family comes from a place of insanity when it comes to freedom and ability to worship or do what you want to do. As the Pope graduated through the Vatican uh, and became Pope, my uncle and he stayed very close as friends. But my uncle was also at Vatican II, which is a huge ecumenical council, which discusses the divinity of Christ. Um, if the first Vatican council, um, which followed the Nicene Council, was <laughs> hundreds of years ago. So this thing that happened in the 1960s was sort of a rebirth of the Christian movement and the idea that, you know, the ability to worship the way you wanted to, whether you were Muslim, Jewish, Christian, didn't matter what it was, it was about your right to do that. Well, when my uncle, you know, would talk about these organizations, he was welcomed into the Knights of St. Gregory. And if you look at the list of Order of the Illuminati, it's at the top, the Knights of St. Gregory, along with the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Malta, they're all relative to that. But but as my uncle, as I mentioned, was highly perceptive, he also understood this, that you keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. And as much as they were trying to glean information from him and utilize his world connections to, uh, you know, aggregate and, and the fact that he was doing what he was doing with mining. And not only that, philanthropically, the first MRI machine that our little town ever got, my uncle bought, donated to the town. He built baseball diamonds, he built community centers all of those kinds of things and sort of a way to, to, to give back. So but my, there were people on a regular basis coming to my uncle's house, like a you know, sleepy little village of Victoria Square, north of Toronto. You know, Richard Nixon is eating at my uncle's house. And Ronald Reagan is borrowing his plane, you know, because my uncle would have to fly somewhere to Europe or Hungary or somewhere like that with what was going on with the business and export and trade. But <laughs> They, they, they would tell me, you know, they, they would always talk about the Illuminati, that, that these people would are like, and, and I don't like really mentioning a lot of names, but, you know, Rothschilds and Rockefellers are some of the people right at the top of the list. And there's some even older world families that are connected into older royalty that are still sitting even in behind the scenes behind that. But the, the, my dad, for, of all, you know, I remember him in his political service, and I said, I should say public service. He hated the concept of the United Nations. He saw it for what it is. He, t he told me, he said this once about the United Nations. Remember, there is no greater face of treachery than the face of virtue. And when you understand the Trilateral Commission, Council for Relations, the Club of Rome, and this is why my uncle understood where these connections to the United Nations and foreign interests pushing buttons inside of concepts, trying to change political views, trying to change political ideals inside of government based on these ideals. It's really no different today. We're actually like in a hyper accelerated version of it with a, a sort of newer idea of what's kind of going on. But they, my dad would always say, you know, the United Nations is not a good thing. Yeah, the, the people forget that the United Nations is a reboot of the League of Nations from the First World War that failed. Many people felt that after the First World War that it was a bad idea. And come the Second World War and the horrors that befell most humans on this planet, in short order, we ended up with the United Nations, which was greatly put together and funded by the Rockefeller family. Um, and under the auspices of the idea that it is virtuous to here to try to help people. But how has it? I mean, you can look back at the last five to six decades and there hasn't been a lot of really good things coming out of the UN. A lot of conjecture, a lot of fighting. 
Um, and I think it's designed to do that. When you can create order out of chaos, you can glean and do whatever you want. You just watch to see where your opportunity lies and you grab it. So, uh, you know, people say, oh, conspiracy theorists in the last 20 years or whatever. Like, I've, I've been talking about this since 1977. <laughs> That's when you and, said that. I was like, this is someone who knows from experience from, you know, 30, 20, 50 years ago, where you, you can say that, where a lot of these people just, you know, have well, conjecture. And, they, and the, the course of crypto politics, even on a, on a smaller level, when my father was mayor, and he and he even had people come into his office and drop brown manila envelopes with money on it, saying, "Well, we want you to run federally to to defuse the vote, right? Like, get out of my, my dad was, you know, if I can swear on your show, if you don't mind, I was like, get the fuck out of my office. <laughs> it's called crazy shit. You can swear it. <laughs> and, 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 and 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 that's why people love my father and my uncle and hated them. They were loved by many people because they were, my dad was, like I say, he was a robust public servant. Still, like, I, if I play a show or a gig or something in the town, I don't live in a township anymore, or I run into somebody, there's invariably some kind of conversation that's going to come up or say, hey, I heard you're at Berman. And, was your father Tony? And I'd be like, yeah, you know, and, and they'd be like, your dad helped me out once. You know, I was having problems with my vegetable stand and like, my dad was that kind of guy because he was a farmer. He was also a football player. He was drafted by the Argos and the Hamilton Tiger Cats back in the 50s out of St. Mike's. His father wouldn't let him play. No, you're going to work on the farm. Um, and uh, he, when you're involved in politics, it's a contact sport. You have to be prepared for a, 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 <laughs> a barrage of different kinds of things and also have this sort of steely like ability and humoristic and sarcastic delivery of language in order to stay alive and to get your point across so while he, he was in ottawa the conservatives and the liberals asked him to cross the floor umpteen times but he said you know what why because all i'm going to do is play party politics i can do more as an independent from my writing uh, and that's what he did. And that's why they garnered that respect, even inside of the business world, because my uncle wasn't a shady businessman. He was by the sort of upper echelon, line, not welcomed into the little groups a lot of the time, but he was well aware of what they all represented, right? Um, and when you have that kind of money and affluence, you are present in front of it. Most people don't talk about it or say anything. It's just like even today with all the pedophile stuff that's going on in Hollywood. You know, it's right. again, uh, you know, where do, where do you begin to open that door? You know, I think uh, that, uh, but again, it, my dad and my uncle were, were some of my greatest teachers because of their experiences, not something that they heard or read about. Right. It, was their, it was their own, you know, circumstances that led them to this position. I remember once my father staying up all night at the kitchen table with a shotgun because the unions were threatening to burn down our house. Like, right. that, that, that was different times, right? Right. <laughs> right? But, but it, it was real. It was real and it was happening. I met the Pope. I met the Pope when he came to Canada and blessed the cathedral. Right? My uncle built the Cathedral of the Transfiguration, which was supposed to be this symbol to religious freedoms for people in North America. Anybody could use it. It's technically a basilica. That means a Pope has blessed the cornerstone. So there's a huge event, you know, the Pope came, Cardinal Carter didn't want him to come, but he was a friend of my uncle. So pissed off the Cardinal when all that happened. Oh, we want him at Downsview for the whole day. And the Pope said, no, I'm going to visit my, my friend Steve. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Well, the Pope's got to have friends, too. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, end of the day, we all yeah. need a friend. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Even the Pope needs a friend. Yeah. Even the Pope needs a friend. <laughs> that is a true statement. So, Ed, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, that your, your, your father and your uncle have had all these experiences and these experiences have shaped you. So share with us some of 
your experiences in your life that you could share? I mean, even as a musician and the things that you've done, you know, share with us some of those things. Well, you know, this is the thing, eh? Like, eh, as a Canadian. Um, <laughs> that's the thing, eh? Come on up, some, like, blogger and we'll go see a moose. <laughs> Get some back bacon. But uh, I, 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 as I mentioned, it, it, I, I kind of think that what, what has been so wonderful about my musical journey is that it came through a, a struggle and, and two different kinds of struggles. One, to be a musician and to work at it repetitively, daily, maybe study it as an education like I did and many other of my friends. It becomes a philosophy, it becomes a lifestyle. And I always felt happy, you know, being connected to that three-dimensional environment. I'm touching an instrument, I'm playing it, I'm tactically relating in a group or an orchestra, I'm in a community or a setting where I'm performing and playing two people. That's where I feel alive. I feel, and that's really another reason why I gravitated. I felt it to be, you know, like, it's like you're like a Jedi or something. <laughs> and you're, you're, you're in, in linguistically, you're, you're sometimes being philosophical in the nature that you're, you're fighting something in, in some way. I, uh, it, music, music can also be a bit of a contact sport, especially when you work, you know, in that industry. It's, it can be a really crazy place. But the other part of that I mentioned, the dyslexia, when I, you know, my, the school calls my mom, you know, your son has a learning disability, uh, we want him tested. And they tested me and it was like a week to, to do this whole thing. And, and they said, well, yeah, your son's dyslexic and he's hyperactive and we want to put him on Ritalin. Mm. And my mom was like, well, what's Ritalin? And we'll it'll just calm him down. It's like a neural sedative kind of a thing. My mom's like, no, you're not going to put my son on medication just so he can. My son is excited. He loves life and he wants to learn. And a classroom for a dyslexic can be some of the it's like being in a prison because it's so flat. You're looking at books, you're reading. Text is two-dimensional. And, and you know, as I mentioned, touching an instrument or playing is like salvation to me. I remember this one time, it was recess, and you, we weren't supposed to be in the school at recess. We were supposed to be out playing ball hockey or doing something else, right? So I snuck in through this little open window into this classroom and started playing the piano that was in this room and and the teacher came opened the door because the door was locked and he wondered how I got into the room <laughs> and and I got I got a detention it was like a three-day detention at lunch I had to sit after I ate my lunch outside the staff room right and I remember people walking by like why you got a detention and I'm like oh I was playing the piano <laughs> like and the, yeah, the, like the, the, the insanity of that right like when you think yeah. in comparison today what children are dealing with in schools um so uh, as, as my mom went, look, you know, here's, she got a guitar. It was from a secretary friend of hers that she knew and her daughter played guitar and a couple instruments and she wasn't playing this. So I got it one year for Christmas. And I've got to tell you, it was my liberating vehicle at that moment at the age of six or seven by going like, I, like it was, you know, it, somebody given me like the, the gift of breath or something because I, we would drive by music stores or something and I'd be like looking out the window like some kind of a dog you know like you know, <laughs> and, you know and crying can we stop can we stop and, no no you're not old enough yet you know and, but I remember the same thing about wanting to drive the tractor you know on the farm you're not old enough yet you can't drive the tractor right. so but <laughs> it, it, it was that moment that I, I went this is for me it in whatever capacity it, it was, whether it was be just something that would be hobby related or or I, I would pursue it as a career. I knew I had to do it. I knew, you know, and and as I said, you know, if, if you're my grandfather said, if you're not whistling when you go to work, you're going on the wrong job. It, it made me happy. It made other people happy when I made up crazy songs and sang at parties. It, it made people happy when I would write them a tune or sing happy birthday or, you know, all of those things electrified me. And it connected me to an incredible world of people and musicians and styles of music and, and friendships that were really birthed 
out of the idea of playing together and like families you know playing in a band for 10 years with a group of people it's not just yeah you know you're going to work punching the clock right. you live and, you live and breathe together you understand each other's happinesses their your sorrows uh it, it it's a real it's, it's like it's a life experience that's hard to come by and as much as it can be vagabondy and sometimes <laughs> the difficult it's well worth the ride it, it's well worth the ride because i'm I, I, it, somebody said, well, why don't you write the big tune, you know, that's going to make you millions of dollars, da, 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 da. Like, I make money at what I do, but I don't need millions of dollars to be happy. I need to be mm -hmm. creative daily, weekly, and connect that idea with what I'm doing. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to stop. Uh, you know, this new single has just come out recently. I, I, I'm, I've been releasing songs under this project title called Recipe for Perpetual Spring now for a year. And I made a joke to somebody the other day. I said, well, yeah, I'm just going to have a continual running album. The title will never change, but singles will just keep coming out forever. And you can put the album together whichever way you want. I want these three songs from here and da 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 da, whatever it is. But like, I, 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 I'm just happy to create every day and, and work and, and do what I do. But, as, you know, I'm also, I still farm. I still have a, a, a huge, huge place here that I look after. I grow an incredible amount of food. It keeps me sane in the 21st century. I have to disconnect from the digital umbilical cord to feel earth grounded you yeah know? Uh, and, and because i've been doing it since i was a kid people are like were well, you a prepper i was like no man my grandparents did this because we did it we all had jobs on the farm when we did stuff my parents did it my brother still does it. my sister still does it today so uh, uh you know i <laughs> i would make jokes to people around, but it's also serious i would say you know i think agriculture should be a part of young and early education mm. and you get kids out there understanding where their food comes from how how, how difficult it can be it can be a struggle uh, yeah and it's an effort right there's a whole new level of tactical appreciation that starts to develop <laughs> and there's something said about knowing how to grow your own food right you know 100%. 100%. absolutely and so yeah i definitely think that it should be taught in school but you know that's just I don't know. I don't think that that's something that they're that they're really interested in right now because, you know, according to most kids, food comes in a box or a bag. Yeah, where did where did your vegetables <laughs> come from? Yeah. So, you know, it comes delivered. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, or or mom and dad go to the grocery store. Yeah. Or, but see that that thing. I think that like so. I I taught for years. Like a lot of my musical friends, I taught music for about twenty four years. And I was also a musical therapist at an institute here for kids. Um, you know, the action of doing something is the is the teacher. And and so often we can get information from a book, but but living experience uh, and doing something is 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 the as I said the educator. Even if you fail, you understand more about why you fail in that effort. Gardening and farming has taught me that. I've had treacherous years of things that I've had to deal with, bad weather, drought, rain, but I still persist. Um, and I, it's taught me to persist in, in, in that way. Uh, and, and the thing about early education, people say, well, it's not really important to really do something like that. Da -da. It's community oriented too. When, when I, when, when my wife and I have gone and taken vegetables to town to sell to people because I've got so much extra stuff, like we'll make a couple hundred bucks, just like pulling into a subdivision. All the kids come, hey, what? You know, and we start, we ask questions. So what is this? They don't know. Like you were saying, Kelly, they like, yeah, what, they don't know. What zucchini? Is it a banana? No, it's not a banana. <laughs> it's, a, it's a yellow zucchini. Right? But that conversation and the idea that, hey, well, you know what? This is worth something. It's not only worth something because I'm, you're paying me for it and you're getting it to eat it, but it's worth something because you have the know-how. And when that little wheel turns, and especially in a young mind, and they go, hmm, I can like not have to pay for something and grow it, or I can make some money maybe doing this, or I can share with other people to help lessen the burden of something somewhere else. 
And that empowering feeling, even if it's small, like people say, well, I don't have a lot of space. I can, you know, you can box garden, you can set up. I mean, I, I built, I built a, a eight stand skid thing the other day out of old skids just to hold some tomatoes outside of my house. I had for half an hour, had fun building this thing, right? For my tomatoes. But, <laughs> it, but, but the point is that you can do it anywhere. And when I get up in the morning, have my coffee, I go out to my tomatoes, I go out to my garden, whatever it is. And I look, I interact. I, it's asking me questions. Hey, I, you gotta weed this today. You know, uh, you're gonna have to water tonight. Uh, man, I'm doing well today. Geez, look at that growth. Like, and then you're like, yes, right? <laughs> like all, all of that means that that effort that you put in is not on a machine. It's not anything you have to pay for. It's the byproduct of something that you do. And if you don't do it, it doesn't happen, right? So that's another lesson in it. Like, well, I could have grown a garden, but you didn't. And, da, da, da. and people say, well, I don't have the time. But yes, there are bulks of effort and, and time that go into doing that, especially on a farm. But there are all these lags too, where you can have space and breathing time in between those things. My brother was telling me a story the other day about when he was younger picking tobacco. They get up at 3.30 in the morning, they start working at five, they were like full work. They work until almost, you know, a meal in the early part of the day, but at three o'clock, the rest of the day is yours. So uh, that also is an empowering thing that my life is not two, four, seven hooked up to some kind of machine and it doesn't shut off. Right. That way the subconscious has time to play with new ideas and concepts. It's where I think the advent of invention comes from even sometimes. Yeah, very true. And you know, one more thing too about gardening too, when you think about it, you're not really doing the work the plant is, right? But it's nice to see it, especially if you if you do it from a seed and to watch it actually come up from the ground. I don't know, there's just something very cool about growing food. I just, I garden every year. So I was just looking at my garden today and I'm a barefoot gardener. I'm out Me there too. with the, yeah, I'm a barefoot gardener. There's nothing like gardening in bare feet. Hey, as soon as you can get your feet into the earth and the grass and you're walking out there, and I don't need these shoes. Socks are like, socks, don't even the word socks. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And it has been such a pleasure having you come on the show and talk and so interesting, your whole family dynamic, everything you got going on. Um, if people are interested in learning more about your music, where would they go? EdWorldman.net, all my social networking buttons are there, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, my YouTube. I'm also on TikTok, a clapper. Uh, what else is there? Rumble. What the but, hell you know, is a clapper? Like, what is a clapper? It, is that it's basically like a newer version of TikTok. <laughs> and it kind of works the <laughs> same <laughs> way. I, but I, I'm so old, <laughs> I'm thinking clapper. Clapper. With the light go on and on. <laughs> it, it doesn't stop, guys. It doesn't ah, stop. I like, that's a new one. <laughs> it doesn't stop. <laughs> it but, does but, not. Uh, uh, Amazon and iTunes, you know, the new singles are out. The last three singles before that are out. All my other records are there. You go to SoundCloud. You can listen to me on, on Spotify. I'm kind of all over the place. Are you going to tour? And I'm waiting um, for a, a little bit of a different frequency in the envelope of existence before I go back out and do that. I've got a, I've got a festival coming up this October, which is great. I'm really excited about that. But... I haven't been on the road since 2019. I was in New York, we were there for a month and I also released the video for Red Omen that I was telling you about. So, but yeah, I love playing live. That's, I'm a ham. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ed, again, thank you so much. We appreciate you. Yes, thank hey, you guys, you. I appreciate you. And you know what, I have to say, like that's some crazy shit podcast. We need <laughs> podcasts like that because <laughs> open, I, open crazy dialogue is what it's all about you know it's like uh, people sitting around a kitchen table and you hear the voice what is going on in there right yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah yeah and you'll never you never know what you will learn you never, never. know never. Oh, say the least pleasure guys thank you for having me you're welcome you know i could sit and have a beer with Ed and have a drink with him and just sit and bullshit and listen to his stories, yeah, listen huh? Yeah, stories, yeah. Yeah. Have him play, you know, have him play something, you know. <laughs>
Well, and I think it's I think it's cool that he is open minded enough to come on our show, right, yeah. and talk about something that's not really related to his music, right? Because right? you know when when you introduce him, you think you know he's gonna just come and talk about music and stuff, but. You know, his family had stuff. That's some crazy shit. His uncle, like, knows the Pope. I know. Uh, that's cool. <laughs> like I said, hey, even uh, the Pope needs a friend, yeah. man. How, how bad is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Pope looks you up when he comes into town. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I bet you being the Pope, I bet you it's kind of lonely being the Pope, you know, because, I mean, to really have a friend, right? Because everybody want something from you but to like have a friend that knew you like before you were the pope right, when you were yeah. just when you were just john paul just yeah. chilling like in the village yeah. right and now you're like the pope and shit so i'm just saying that'd be now that'd be like you know one of us being a religious leader yeah you know, you know? i mean that's just it's just interesting like i said even the pope needs a friend it's nice to know that the Pope had a friend. That makes me feel better. I know that is cool, huh? Yeah, you know. But yeah, I, I could, I could have. I like that. He was cool too. Yes. You know, so don't you think like, time. don't you think like Buddha needs a friend? I mean, granted, you're you're a Buddha, but don't you too need somebody to talk to? Don't you need a friend? Aren't we social creatures just by nature? By nature, we are. You know, so and both. so now let's let's segue. If we have music, we can insert that song. Thank you for being my friend. There you go. Well, you just did it. Thank you for being my friend. Yeah. We don't need cool. to go ahead. We don't even need to bring the music in because you just did it. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, don't you know? Don't you know? I would just that think that cool. the Buddha would need a friend. Pope has a friend. Everybody's the Buddha's friend. But are they though? Everybody? I don't think well, everybody. Buddha, you know, because he's Buddha. But I don't think everybody's the Buddha's friend. Well, maybe like work friend. Well, that's what I'm saying. Okay, work friend and friend friends are not the same thing. Right, right. We did. We talked about. And we that talked about bit. this. So I'm maybe saying everybody. Not everybody's a friend, but he may, you know, everyone may be a work friend. And everybody can be friendly, but that doesn't make them all friends. So I said, oh. that's why I said, does the Buddha have that one friend, that homie that they can call and be like, man, you know what happened to me today? Wow. Well, you know, I would think he did. We just don't know because didn't, who was Jesus? Did Jesus have a number one? I don't know my religion. I don't know. I mean, I know that Jesus had 12 apostles, but they didn't say anything about him being friends. Now, did they? Well, that's the thing. They may have been. Was an apostle like your friend? Well, or was your apostle like your follower? Like, oh, I'm, I'm hanging on your every word, but uh, are you my friend? Oh, I'm just saying. I, you know, and, uh, according to the Bible, one of them wasn't his friend, right? That's we know that true. for but, sure. But then they have, but then they changed that. Where yeah. Judas had his own, uh, what, what did they call them? Like his own part of the, they found a different part where he was actually, Jesus knew he was the only one who was strong enough to turn him in so that he could be re 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 resurrected, excuse me. And so that changed that narrative after how many thousands of years? Just saying. Yeah. You know, so, but that, were they just work friends? Yeah. That's a thing. You know what? That's interesting. I bet Buddha, I bet Buddha had a buddy. Just saying. Yeah. Did Did Jesus have a buddy? And if so, which one? Because you know, having having a circle of twelve, that's hard. It's hard to maintain a circle of like two, three, four friends. But twelve? Come on, man. Jesus did. I mean, they, he had twelve apostles. But I will. I'm not. I would just think, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, if you're all religious, I'm sorry. No, I'm not, just, we're, we're just talking, you know, we're yeah, just talking. We're I'm just saying, uh, would, you know, did he, were those, were one of those apostles more of a friend than, than others? 
I'd say yes, but I don't know because I I'm not well versed in Christianity. But well, I, I don't I think yes. I don't think it would be in Christianity. I mean, we don't know everything that was said between Jesus and the apostles, no, right? You know, I'm just I'm just going by what. You know, I maybe find Jesus out was like literature. you know, maybe Jesus said you know, Peter's my dude. I just yeah. he's just that homie that. That's what I'm saying. You know? I don't know. Maybe he was. Hey, James was the brother of Jesus. So maybe that was his homie. Yeah. You know? you know, I don't know. I'm just saying. I would just like to think that he had one. But And, and this is kind of funny because this could go back to when we talked about the random bullshit. If you could go back and witness a time, you know, maybe you could go back and you could be sitting next to Buddha. Maybe Buddha and Jesus were buddies. And maybe. they're like, I love you, man. I love you. You know, maybe. You know, I'm just saying, I just like to think that, you know, everybody has that one person, no matter how big or extraordinary you are, that, I mean, even Jeff Bezos has, I would hope, that one person that he knows, no matter how rich I get, you know, you're, or, you know, and if I were to lose my money tomorrow, you would still be my homie because you're my friend. And you don't really care about my money. You are my friend. That's I would hope. going to be with us when we blow up. Okay. You know? So I'm just but, saying, you know. I would like to think that everybody has at least one person that that's not family that they can say truly is their friend, regardless of who they are. Right? Even Putin needs a homie. Well, yeah, and I'm sure he has one. Just saying. I bet you Hitler had one too. Everybody needs a homie. Yeah, was it him, Hitler's buddy? That's what we're oh, told, but well, do we really all. know? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know that's who yeah. who he was fist bumping with after he was making yeah. these speeches. Like that, you know, or who was like, what does this sound like? Let me read this to you. What do you think? You could go, that's another time you could go back. No, nah, I don't think I'd go back to Hitler time, James. I'm yeah, good. that was a, that was actually. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to go back, well armed, into that. Kit. No, I'm good. I, the 40s, I'm good. I'm good. You know, there wasn't a really good time for uh, black folks in this country. I would say, not really a good time. No, I have to agree with you. There's no so, arguing. Not a time that I'd be like, oh yeah, I want to go back to the golden era of the fifties. Not, not really the best time yeah. for us in the fifties, right? Oh, I want to go back to the cowboy days. Not really a good time for us, you know, pre Civil War or post Civil War. Not good hey, times. But there were some badass black cowboys. Yes, but you don't know about them. I do. Well, we you can read talk about. Okay. Okay. You read, sir, but I'm just saying, not a good time. So when I think about going back in the time, not not a good time. You would have to go pre, pre-slavery. pre And if I could go back in the time, I would divert that whole, the first time you ever came and tried to catch a slave, you would catch these hands and you would never come back. Nip that in the bud, huh? <laughs> yeah. So that's the time that I would go back to, right? We would be fully on, prepared for your ass. You are going to catch whatever, but it ain't going to be one of us. You're going to catch something you wish you did not catch. Yeah, no shit. Right? We're going to dive. That's interesting. So that's what I would do if I could go back into time. Thank you by Kelly Morgan. Thank you. That was... <laughs> that was random. See, we delivered. <laughs> that was random. So you can go to our website, which is that some crazy shit podcast.com. There is all of our social media. Actually, I do apologize. Um, there's some times that I didn't put social media up, so I apologize. I try to always promote who our guests are, and sometimes I forget or get lazy. So if you if you're a if you're a regular listener and say, hey, the podcast came out, but there was no promotion on any of the social media like Facebook or Instagram, that's that's my bad. I will take uh, ownership of that because I just sometimes I forget and sometimes 
I just uh, you know, let me just throw this out, people. She's the only one who does social media because she knows that I screw it up. So yeah, and I just gotta say this, and we put that, this one more thing. I don't have any social media on my phone. So if I want to use social media, I have to actually come to a laptop and open it up and do everything from the laptop. So I don't have any social media and I don't have any news feeds on my phone. What do I have on my phone? I have a couple of games and I have lots of movie apps like HBO Max and Tubi and Peacock and Hulu. And I have that type of stuff. Um, but I don't have any news. I get my news from the Weather Channel app. They send or me news. Or me. Or, or me. you. Um, but yeah, I don't, yeah. I like, I, I've been free now for like a while of social media. See, but you know, I, and I appreciate that because you do the social media for the podcast, but you don't have any other social media. Yeah, that's the only time I go on and look at social media is what I'm posting. So I wanted to take a, yep, I wanted to take a social media break. So I didn't even post for the podcast. And now that I've had my little break, I will make sure that I will be posting the promos. And as a side note, you can now post really nice from your computer to Instagram. Before you couldn't, Instagram was really made for the phone. It was really kind of difficult. You could do it from a laptop, but you had to do an extra step. You don't have to do that anymore. They've made it now. It's just a click, just like Facebook or any other app. So now you can go post from your computer, which is why I no longer have Instagram on my phone. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, James. Until next time, keep your minds open. <laughs> <laughs>